all done uh, let me start now so hello everyone and thanks for joining on a saturday 15 4 2023 and today we are going to continue talking about null geodesics and we have a lot to say indeed um, give me a second to just set up a few things Good. Okay, so last time we defined prompt geodesics. Prompt, actually a prompt causal curve. And the purpose of defining it was that it's going to be a kind of proxy for something uh, that was very natural in the time-like case. If this is going to be a proxy in the null case. And that was uh, trying to understand what geodesic is longer or shorter. And the problem is that in GR, every null geodesic has an invariant length of zero, and that's all we can say about it in terms of length. But still, some geodesics are some null geodesics are better than others, and uh, <laughs> that's what our uh, job is to figure out. Okay, so. Um, the definition of prompt causal curve was that if I have a point P and I have a point Q both in space time, and now I've introduced a notation in my notes that P is equal to X P T P. So the in, in some coordinate system, the space and time uh, uh, coordinates for the point P are called X P and T P, likewise for Q. And now, supposing I have a curve uh, gamma that goes from P to Q. So if I say it's from P to Q, it really means that it starts at XP at time TP and ends at XQ at time TQ. And uh, it's prompt if there's no other causal curve. whose starting space-time point is the same. So from P, which I'll write very explicitly as XP, TP, to XQ, T prime, which is less than TQ. So in this drawing, we draw it like this. So this point I can call Q prime. It's just under Q, that means uh, it's got the same X, uh, coordinate xq but its time coordinate remember this is a space time diagram so this is all of x and this is t so its time coordinate is less than that of q and that means the second curve gamma prime got there to the same destination that is xq earlier okay now uh, if there is no such thing then gamma will be prompt Okay, so nothing can do better than gamma in terms of reaching a given spatial destination. Okay, now uh, there are various properties and we are now going to explore these properties of prompt uh, paths. And uh, the, that's going to at least take up half our time today, if not more. So let's um, <clears throat> uh, list some of them. Some are easy to prove, some are tedious to prove, some I will prove, some I won't prove here, and I'll refer you to the references. Okay, so one, um, yeah. So of course, um, yeah, okay. So let me first make the statement. Um, if a path, causal path always, P to Q is prompt, then Q can't just be anywhere. Q must lie in J plus, sorry, in the boundary of J plus of P. So remember that J plus is the uh, causal future and the boundary of it uh, is where Q must lie. Now, <clears throat> it looks very trivial because uh, in Minkowski space, that's very obvious. Uh, this is trivial in Minkowski space because uh, to, to reach 
a prompt path in particular has to be null. And to reach any point by a null path, uh, I need to be on the light cone. Okay, so that's an obvious statement in uh, uh, in in Minkowski space, but it's not obvious in a manifold, and it becomes obvious if you look at the definition of prompt uh, in this picture, because if you see, this means that there's a point Q prime accessible from P that is vertically below the point Q. Okay, now uh, this is when the if if there is such a point, then the uh, that's re reachable by a causal path. That means inside the causal future of P, then the path original path is not prompt. Okay, so if the original path is prompt, then such a point Q prime should not exist. Okay, and that means uh, and, and since Q prime can be as close as we like to Q. Uh, other than being exactly on top of it, it means that there isn't a neighborhood of Q. Uh, so from the diagram, no neighborhood of Q accessible by a causal path. That's what prompt implies. Okay, uh, and if there's no such neighborhood of Q accessible by the causal by a causal path, then Q must lie on boundary of the future of P. So that's one property. Uh, this is a relatively <clears throat> simple one. Maybe I even mentioned it last time. Now there are two more interesting properties. So this, let's say one uh, property. Are there any questions about this one? It's Saturday, so we can sort of start slow a bit. If anyone has any uh, confusions, this would be a good time. Uh, is this true for any geometry? Uh, so we are always talking of globally hyperbolic space time, but other than that, yeah, any geometry. Okay. It's a, it's a definition and it's important, in, it's particularly important uh, in a, in a <clears throat> non-trivial geometry. In Minkowski, we don't need to make all these definitions. And in fact, as I think I mentioned last time, there's a, you know, if you take a point in the light cone, future light cone of a given point, I can go there by a unique null geodesic and it's prompt and there's nothing to compare it with. Okay, So non-promptness is a feature of either topology or geometry, that geometry meaning curvature and topology meaning topology. So one or the other has to be there, has to be non-trivial and we'll see a few examples. Otherwise, everything is just prompt. Okay, now the um, second thing is uh, that, sorry, please. Yeah, uh, so I don't understand why you're saying that any neighborhood of Q won't have any causal path. All, all that I need is that there is no causal path uh, just at the space-time point of Q and below Q, right? But there could always be causal paths which lie like... Uh, near I didn't say any neighborhood of Q. I said no neighborhood of Q. So supposing there is a causal path to a point Q prime, right? Yes. In this diagram. And Q prime is separated by a distance epsilon from Q below it. Okay, then it, there's also a causal path to a point that's in the midpoint between Q prime and Q. It just goes a little slower, or it can just go up to Q prime and stop there. And if a particle that's moving stops somewhere, then its uh, world line becomes vertical. So it will reach another point, right? So from Q prime, prime, this point, this particle can reach or this curve can reach any point between Q prime and Q. Okay, so we better have no neighborhood for Q. Otherwise, uh, we'll be able to reach a point in that neighborhood in the causal future. Think of it this way. Uh, I said prompt implies no neighborhood of Q accessible by a causal path. This logically is the same as saying if there is a neighborhood of Q accessible by a causal path, then the original path cannot be prompt. Now think this through. If there's a neighborhood of Q accessible by a causal path, then certainly Q can't be on the boundary of the causal future. 
And if it's not on the bound, that, that's exactly what I'm trying to prove. Okay. So this is the, uh, that, that immediately tells me that uh, I can have a more prompt path than the original one. It's very difficult stuff, let me emphasize. It's only going to get more difficult today. This is the most difficult subject I've ever tried to teach. And I, um, I tell people that, you know, while preparing these lectures, I feel my brain is kind of getting pulled and poked in all directions. It's very hard. But it's also a lot of fun. You have to take it coolly, easily, and uh, learn a few things at a time and start small and make small incremental progress. And you will get there. And it's very rewarding because I don't know any subject of physics that has this much intense depth of physical consequence from very mathematical and initially very abstract considerations. So just uh, give it time and it will settle. But also fix your background. If there's any background that you need, you will have to get that independently from a GR textbook. Okay, next property. Um, okay. Uh, now we are always in globally hyperbolic space time, so I'm not going to keep writing that. Uh, so if a null geodesic is non-prompt up to some point, can it become prompt after that? And um, the uh, third, uh, so the answer is actually no. And although I've, I've given a proof in the notes, I'm going to postpone the proof of this uh, by a few minutes and we'll see that it will become a consequence of something else. At least I think it will, give me a second. Yeah, I think it will become a consequence of something and I'll actually, re I just realized that and I'll rewrite my notes to reflect that. But let's understand the physics of it, okay? It's non-prompt from, let's say, P up to some point, uh, P, uh, P1 up to some point, P2. And so in this region, it's non-prompt. Now, my question is not whether it can be prompt in the region P2, P3, but whether it can become prompt as a full geodesic from P1 to P3. So non-prompt in this segment, let's say prompt in this segment, but can the whole thing be prompt? And... Um, it's a bit uh, tricky because uh, this null geodesic is obviously null. Uh, uh, it's null. So it's not like it's going slower than the speed of light. You, you might think intuitively the following. If somebody travels a bit uh, of distance slower than the speed of light and after that goes to the speed of light, can their average speed be the speed of light? Obviously not. Hmm? So that's a, that's a simple thing. Speed of light is a bound. So if you ever travel slower than that, then your full trajectory cannot be at the speed of light. But that's not what we are trying to prove here because the geodesic is always null. So it's always traveling at the speed of light, but it's not prompt in the initial segment. And later it becomes prompt. Okay. And question is that if that happens, then does it on the whole remain prompt? That means the whole geodesic from start to finish, can it become prompt? by picking up uh, something later, by doing something properly later? And the answer is no. And roughly the reason is that if it's non-prompt here, then uh, we have this uh, nice uh, picture that there's another uh, point, P2 prime, under P2, where I can go and reach my destination X2 earlier. Okay, now that I'm at X2 earlier, I can continue in a prompt way up to X3, and I'll also reach it earlier. I simply remain continuously above whatever this original non-prompt curve was trying to do. Sorry, below whatever this curve was trying to do. 
Hmm? So my red curve can always, oh, the software joins up lines which don't, I don't want joined. It's very bad. Excuse me. Or maybe I did something wrong. So here is P3. Here's P3 prime under it. And what I'm saying is that this line can continue here under, under the other line. Okay. And this we call shadowing argument. This is actually a proof of the original statement. Namely, if this segment is not prompt, then this shadow curve exists, which reaches the same space point earlier. Now, whatever this might do to reach P3, this one having started life before the one above uh, by a tiny distance, which is blind to any topology or any features of the manifold, simply continues chugging along at a tiny, dist tiny distance below the other one. And below means if you're thinking of a runner on a racetrack, that person is in front. Okay, so if I'm in front of you at some point and we both have a maximum possibility to travel at the speed of light, I simply remain in front of you and you can never overtake me. And that's what this shadowing thing means. Hmm? So this is actually the proof of this, but we'll see that there's a simpler proof later. But this proof is important because it's the basis of all proofs of such uh, statements about null geodesics. Okay, now there's another version of this statement. If a null geodesic is prompt initially, can it later become non-prompt? This is an uh, opposite of the previous situation. And this is like, someone who's running their best, but can they later slow down? But again, it's not that, because that would imply that their speed reduces. And here we are working in a space of only null geodesics. Everybody is going at the speed of light, but possibly along different paths in the manifold. So is it possible that a null geodesic, uh, which is um, initially prompt, can later become uh, non-prompt? And there's a nice topological proof of this, uh, which is in my notes, but and let me try to reproduce it. So here the answer is yes, it can. Okay, and the proof uh, has uh, is the following. Let's, uh, so first of all, if it's initially prompt and later non-prompt, then as a whole uh, thing, it's non-prompt, right? Because uh, it can be in, it later becomes non-prompt. So there's somebody who can take off and reach before it. Let's, let's sketch that. So here are the two segments, P1 to P2 to P3. Here it's prompt. So nobody can be under it, but here it's non-prompt. And therefore, by definition of non-prompt, there's another curve under it, which reaches the location of P3 earlier, namely X3. But now this combination, this and this, is a non-prompt curve. Okay, so, sorry, this, com uh, sorry, I, I said that wrong. This combination means the existence of this curve means that this original one was not prompt. Okay, I hope this was clearer. Okay, the existence of this means that this is non-prompt, which we are given, but if this exists, then this also exists, the whole thing, and the whole thing starts at P1 and ends up at X3 before uh, the point P3, so therefore this is more prompt than this, and therefore the original curve is non-prompt, so therefore it's possible that a curve which starts prompt can become later become non-prompt, okay. And actually, this is enough proof, I think. Let me skip the topological proof. Uh, but I think for those who are interested, it's well worth going through. It involves um, basically some statement. It, it involves actually using the axiom of um, strong causality. So, so it's, it's a good exercise for you to go through. Hmm? Look up proof in the, in the note. They are in the, it's in my notes. Okay. Good. So uh, was this okay so far? Uh, there's some questions in the chat, I have a feeling. Doesn't that the same thing that happens in uh, gravitational lensing? Yes, correct. 
uh, Vivek asked, is P2 a given point? Uh, yes. I mean, what I do is I have a curve P1 to P3, and I'm only given that it's prompt in the first segment. Okay. Uh, so the question is, can it become non-prompt? Now, between P2 and P3, okay, there are non-prompt curves. Okay, there's always, it's always possible. Given a prompt curve, finding a non-prompt curve is not difficult. So, assuming that this becomes non-prompt in the segment P2 to P3, we see that the whole thing is also not prompt. And so, it's perfectly possible. That's all we are saying. In fact, there's a stronger statement that any null geodesic in a very small initial region is always prompt. And it's only later on in the large when it can experience topology or curvature that it will start to become non prompt That's the uh, intuition behind this. Okay. Now, with these things out of the way, uh, we need to discuss focal points because what is our goal? Our goal is pretty much similar to what we did uh, in the last few lectures, talking about focal points and, and trying to see of geodesics and trying to see whether uh, their existence is um, uh, points to some singularity of the space-time manifold. The new thing uh, today and the end of last time was the fact that we are now talking about null geodesics. And a very beautiful fact is that many things are the same and many things are not the same. And so it's up to us to be very clear in our minds which things are the same and which things are not the same between null and time-like geodesics. Okay. Now, uh, can there be a focal point? Well, there's never a problem for there to be a focal point. A focal point would arise if I have a null geodesic. Now, again, it's not something which arises in Minkowski space, so you're not going to be able to imagine it easily. But imagine that gamma 1, gamma and gamma prime are both uh, null geodesics. Okay, in fact, both prompt null geodesics. If I say prompt, I don't have to say null because if it's prompt, it has to be null. It's the other way. If it's null, it doesn't have to be prompt. Hmm? Okay, so let's assume they are both prompt and they focus. So that means that uh, they both come out of the point P1, space time point, and they both refocus at the point P2. This is what also happened with time-like geodesics. Now it's happening with null geodesics. And the problem is this. Supposing I take the original gamma and I continue it to a point like this, P3. Okay. So this is all gamma. In this way of stating it, gamma prime is a geodesic only between a sec uh, that's that's only um, uh, there between P1 and P2, and then re-meets gamma at P2. Okay, I don't want to continue gamma prime, I want to continue gamma. Now the point is that gamma from P1 to P2 was prompt. I chose it that way. Okay, and you might think that now that I am prompt, I'm merrily sailing along very prompt, and I'm going to keep being prompt as long as I feel like. Okay, and this is what breaks down if there's a focal point. So what we are going to show now is that due to this focal point, gamma is no longer prompt when extended beyond it. Just the mere fact of a focal point tells us that gamma is no longer prompt uh, as a curve from P1 to P3. Now, what does this remind us of? Uh, we studied spatial geodesics on a spatial manifold, and we found that a uh, spatial geodesic no longer minimizes its distance after um, uh, a focal point. We also found that a in a space-time, a time-like geodesic no longer maximizes its proper time after a focal point. And now we are seeing that for null geodesics, uh, it no longer remains prompt after a focal point. So they're all kind of 
comparable statements, but this is sort of the correct technical term and correct physical concept for null geodesics because we cannot talk about maximizing or minimizing proper distance since every proper distance in this diagram is zero. Okay, so let's uh, show the, uh, this is, uh, the, yeah, let's show that the existence of um, uh, a focal point uh, immediately destroys the promptness um, of the original path. Okay, so, the way to see it, it's quite simple. Uh, we note the following. Supposing we, uh, so it's the same idea. Originally, we were trying to go on this path up to here. Now we, what we do is we do switching. If you remember, there was a thing called switching and smoothing. So we switched to this and then we continued to that. That's what we did in the time like case. And then we smoothed out the kink and we got something that maximized the proper time. That's not what exactly what we are going to do here. Uh, we are going to do something slightly different. We are first going to switch to this. So that's the same. Then we are going to notice. Uh, so first switch. So let's do it in steps first. Switch to gamma prime in the segment. Uh, P, P1, P2. Okay. Recall that gamma and gamma prime both in the segment P1, P2, within that segment, they are both prompt. That's given to us. Okay. So I've not uh, changed any promptness by doing that. However, there's a kink now because now my new path is this one. And a line with a kink can't be a geodesic. It's a simple fact. The new path as a kink after I continue beyond P2. So it can't be a geodesic. And it certainly therefore can't be a null geodesic. And if it's not a null geodesic, then it's definitely not prompt. So what we've seen is that this path from here to here is not prompt. But if it's not prompt, then there's a new path from here that reaches P3 earlier than the previous one. So then there's a new path. Red. That reaches P3 earlier. But now, Notice that because it reaches P3 earlier, it's actually defeating not only the yellow curve. So this red curve is not only defeating this yellow curve, it's also defeating the original thing which we were hoping to make prompt. We were trying to take this gamma, continue it past a focal point and insist that it is still prompt. But the existence of this red curve defeats that and therefore the original thing was not prompt. So we proved this statement due to the focal point gamma is no longer prompt when extended beyond the focal point is that proof clear questions okay what have we established then we've established the fact that a focal point is bad for promptness I'll write it as a kind of slogan. And I remind you again that earlier also a focal point was found to be bad for uh, maximizing proper time in the case of time like geodesics or minimizing spatial distance just in the case of spatial manifolds. So this is the badness of focal points that what you thought you're doing, what you thought you're achieving by a geodesic, you're actually not achieving. Okay. By the way, nowhere did we say that there has to be a focal point in order to spoil promptness. We are saying that if there's a focal point, then promptness is gone. But there could be other ways that promptness is gone without there being a focal, focal point. We are not commenting on that. So I hope it's clear that uh, the implication is one way. Focal point implies no promptness after when you continue beyond it. 
Okay. Now uh, we are in a position to prove a result, which, uh, so this was result number uh, three. This was property number three. This I should have numbered as A, B, C, I think. So not to con clash with that numbering. And now we'll do property four. Uh, and this is a nice one, promptness uh, of a null geodesic is true if and only if that null geodesic is achronal. So promptness, promptness and achronality are equivalent for a null geodesic. Okay, what was achronality? Remember, so let's write it. A chronal was one. The, the space A chronal is a property of any subset of M uh, that is everywhere space like or null. And two has no time like path. A chronal set. Let's call it a set S. No time like path between two points in S. Okay. Now, the first thing in our case for a null geodesic that's already uh, taken care of, it's null. Okay, so it already satisfies property one. So we only need to uh, check that a prompt geodesic has no time like path between two points on it. So let's draw the claim. This is, oh, this is very bad drawing. It's always, uh, it's supposed to be null. So, okay, again, it's very hard to draw because we are not in Minkowski space. Otherwise, all these things are very trivial. Okay, so here's a prompt. So here's gamma and it's prompt, I declare. Now, my question is, can I have a path roughly like this? From P1 to P2, which is time-like. Okay, if I can have such a path, then uh, my null geodesic is not achronal. If I can prove that there's no such path, then it is achronal. Okay. And by now you might be actually familiar, you might be getting used to the method of proof. Let's prove it in the first direction. Let's assume that there is such a path. Okay. If there's such a path, then of course, this being time-like can't be prompt. Okay. So therefore there's a shadow path from here to here, which gets there faster to P2 than the original one, okay? Once you have a shadow, then you continue shadowing till you reach the end. And this way you've proved that the original curve is not prompt. It's very simple. It's literally one, one sentence, okay? Shall I repeat it? If there is a time-like path connecting two points on a prompt null geodesic, then you can find a shadow path that reaches P2 earlier. And once it's a shadow path from here to here, it just continues shadowing till the end. And therefore this whole thing is a shadow path which reaches Q2 earlier than the original null geodesic. So the original is not prompt. So what we have proven is not a chronal. implies not prompt. Okay. Now uh, we want to prove the reverse. Okay. Wait, um, now, sorry. Yeah. I, I have a doubt. I mean, you're Please. drawing this, this blue line is prompt, right? I mean, that's yes. the initial assumption that gamma was yes. prompt. Yes. But then you took uh, a yellow, yellow detour, which was time like. Yes. That, yeah, that's possible if the thing is not achronal. Okay. Yeah, yellow detour, which is time-like, it's not a detour, it's a time-like connection between two yeah, points. Yeah, yeah. That's what not achronal means. It means that such a yellow thing exists. Okay, okay. So that contradicts my original assumption of having been prompt. 
All right, got it. Hmm? So by contradiction, I proved that not acronal is not prompt. Now I want to prove that if it's prompt, then it's acronal. So sorry, if it's non-prompt, then it's okay. So I want to prove now in the reverse direction. In the reverse direction, I assume not prompt. The same curve, P to Q, let me draw it again. And now I assume it's not prompt. And that means that from the beginning, I know that there's a shadow curve which gets there earlier. Okay. Now, as I told you earlier, uh, if it gets here, Q prime, Q prime is the same space point as Q, it's just an earlier time. So if I get there earlier and I just sit on my backside for a little bit of time, I continue this way and I reach Q. Okay. So now this, if you see, this curve has a, um, so this other curve um, is a shadow path. The shadow path generically is not null. And in particular, the last segment is not null, right? The last segment is strictly time-like, this one. Now, there's a theorem that if I have a causal curve, which has a uh, time-like segment, then I can distort it a tiny amount, you see, so that it's everywhere time-like. So even if PQ prime had some null segments, the last segment is definitely timed like this one. And therefore, I can distort it until I get this curve, which is time like and from P to Q, which is along the original geodesic. But that means we found a time like uh, curve from P to Q. Hence, not acronym. So, We've now shown that acronal and prompt are the same thing because in either direction. So if you assume that it's not acronal, that means there's a time-like path in some segment, then you can use that to destroy promptness. If you assume that there's not <coughs> that the original uh, curve is not prompt, then you can use its shadow to destroy acronality. So you get not acronal. Hmm? And so uh, therefore we have proved that prompt and acronal are the same thing. And this is nice because I was asking last time because the word prompt is not really there in the literature as far as I could find uh, prior to Witten's uh, notes from 2019 or whenever, uh, I think 19, uh, 19. But uh, I believe that the proxy or the role of that concept is taken by acronality. So prompt null geodesic or acronal null geodesic is the same thing. And now you can actually try to prove these earlier theorems. This I leave to you as an exercise that a null geodesic, which is non-prompt up to some point, can it become prompt after that? Or that a null geodesic, if it's prompt, uh, if it's uh, prompt initially, sorry, yeah, if it's non-prompt, can it become prompt? And if it's initially prompt, can it become non-prompt? Both of these, I believe, have a simple answer. The, the proof is simple if you transfer promptness into acronality, because then once you once you have that, then it boils down to existence of time-like curves, and you can immediately prove this. So this is an exercise to which will help you to verify that you have understood things. I might actually rephrase uh, the notes a little bit to highlight this point. Okay. In null case, focal points which path from null like to time like. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, first of all, let's be careful about the switching. So, this was the original, original path and it was all null. This is also null. Okay, because this and this are both prompt null geodesics focusing at a point. Therefore, this is also null, but it's not a geodesic because a geodesic in addition to being null at every point should be smooth. You see, it's not null at this point because it has a kink. 
When you have a kink, you can't be null. So it's locally null everywhere before the kink and everywhere after the kink, but it fails to be null over there. And that alone, the kink alone makes it non-prompt. So this is a case where P1 to P2 along this is prompt, P2 to P3 along this is prompt, but P1 to P2 to P3 along this is not prompt. It's weird, but that's how it is because of the kink. So it's always about the kink, you know, in the, even in the spatial case, we saw that basically smoothing the kink helps you minimize distance. Here, what happens is that, uh, so that meant that when there was a kink, you were no longer geodesic, right? Let's go back to the case of the uh, spatial manifold, a sphere or something with uh, geometric spatial curves going from North Pole to South Pole. And what we saw was that after focusing, if I switch from one uh, segment to another, which are both geodesics from North to South Pole, thereby inducing a kink, uh, then even though the north to south is minimizing distance and south to that other point is also minimizing distance, but the total distance is not minimized. That's exactly how it works, right? Remember how it goes on this sphere. We go from north to south and we come up on the other side. But now that we are up on the other side, there's a completely different path which is minimizing the distance. It's not this one. So just adding two geodesics, Connecting two geodesics doesn't necessarily make a geodesic. And if you connect them in a way which has a kink, then you can be absolutely sure that that's not a geodesic because then you can smooth it. Okay. And in this case, the analog of smoothing in the null case is to say that, well, that means this is not prompt. So there's something more prompt. And that makes the original one non prompt because both the original and this kinky one both reached at the same time T3. But this shadow curve reaches earlier. Once it reaches earlier, it's made all the other curves non-prompt. Good. Thanks. That was a good question. Okay. Now, uh, in applications, we are going to... So, we have been talking about promptness from P to Q. But we can also define promptness... from uh, S to P, where S is a subset of M. You can be quite a generic, you can take it as a sub-manifold, for example. That's a very convenient choice. And there's just a little bit of subtlety involved. So here's S. And here's P. And just to make S a little bit general, I'll bend it a little so that it doesn't look like some simple thing. Okay. Now, prompt uh, will be so prompt. Earlier we had prompt geodesics from a point um, P1 to a point P2. Uh, actually, let me call this point Q now. P, so from a point P to a point Q. So let me call this Q. And so uh, there we were comparing uh, paths which go from an initial space-time point P to the spatial location of Q. So here again, I'll label the spatial location of Q as XQ, TQ. But when we uh, talk of paths from S, we rather uh, say that it goes from anywhere on S to Q. Okay, so these, let's say, these are all null geodesics uh, from S to Q. Okay, and we can ask whether any of them is prompt. And just one of them, for example, will fail to be prompt uh, if there's another path that doesn't necessarily have to start in the same place, namely here, but it has to start on S and end before the previous path here. It has to end at an earlier time, but it could start from anywhere else on S. Okay. We had assumed that the original path is prompt from S. So this is promptness from S uh, means exactly that, that this path will be prompt from S if there's no other path from S that gets to Q to XQ earlier. 
Okay. Is it clear? In other words, we stop asking about um, the starting point. In, instead, we allow the starting point to vary over a whole manifold. Okay. And we compare paths which uh, uh, all start from the original manifold, but we don't insist they all start at the same point of that original manifold. If you look back in the notes, that's exactly what we did for maximizing proper time from a sub-manifold to a point using time like geodesics. And we are doing the same uh, uh, for uh, promptness in the case of null geodesics. Okay. And from this argument, focal point also from of curves from S has a meaning uh, slightly different. So a focal point will be that there are two prompt geodesics. So both can be prompt, both start from S and that, that would be a focal point. So again, uh, so this is a focal point of geodesics from S to Q. Earlier, we had talked of focal point of geodesics from P to Q, where P was a fixed point. Okay. And there's a last comment, which is that if S is space like, which is often going to be the case in the future, then this intersection has to be orthogonal. And this is another argument that's parallel to an argument made for time like geodesics which is that if this intersection was not orthogonal, then by moving the contact point where this geodesic hits S slightly, I could reduce this, I could make this angle more vertical and I would actually gain uh, in promptness. Therefore, it can't be prompt if it's not orthogonal. So in other words, if S is space-like, then uh, a prompt geodesic Space like implies that a prompt geodesic must intersect S orthogonally. Okay. Good. So that was the generalization. So this figure already shows you the generalization of all our discussions. Uh, both on promptness and on focal points to uh, null geodesics that uh, start at a manifold S and end at a point Q. Uh, or, of course, you can time reverse it. Yeah. Can we say then that there exist unique achronal or prompt null geodesics connecting all P2 to P1 in a manifold? That is a very good question, but I don't think it's true that they are unique. Ah, uh, oh, P1 to P2, yeah, uh, oh, good. I think that must be true, sorry. Uh, thank you, Shikhar, this is very interesting. Let me give it a thought. So if there was more than one, no, I think that's not true. Uh, in fact, in fact, it's not true. Exactly the situation I've discussed here, uh, the focal point case, where did I do focal points? Here. This is exactly a case where you have P1, you have P2, and you have two prompt null geodesics from one point to another. So non-uniqueness is exactly the same as having a focal point. If it's unique, then there's no focal point. Is that point clear? Good, thanks. Very good. Okay. Now, uh, all this was in language of geodesics. And now we need to get to uh, coordinates on an, uh, uh, yeah, coordinates. So now we need to do the analog of, so we, what is our goal? We are heading for a right Chaudhary equation for this system. Okay. We want to know about the existence of focal points using Einstein's equations. Okay, so how are we going to get there? So this, I'm going to call it null right Chaudhary equation, although uh, right Chaudhary didn't have it obviously in his paper, uh, but it's a rather straightforward generalization, but it has some wrinkles and we are just going to discuss them now. 
uh, now Rai Chaudhary himself being an incredibly modest person, if you look at his um, uh, memoirs, there's a special issue of Pramana. I'll try to put up all these uh, things uh, on my blog um, for you to read, browse later. Uh, in his reminiscences, he's like, yeah, I found an equation, but it really wasn't the right case because I was doing time-like case and they really needed null. He's referring to Penrose's application of it. Uh, so they generalized it, but they still credited me. That's very nice of them and so on. And although there's some truth in uh, that, it's uh, overly modest on his part, because as I said, once you set up the problem, then the actual equation follows in exactly the same way as his. And in fact, it's the same equation almost. But setting up is very important. And the person who did that was Sachs. And he um, has a very beautiful paper where he sets up the problem. And from the, he has also another paper where he does the null analog of right of the equation. But uh, we are going to follow it in the order of first setting up the geometry and then um, uh, deriving the equation. Now, what do I mean by setting up the geometry? So recall that in the time-like case, in time-like case, we started with uh, a Cauchy hypersurface sigma, and then we considered time-like geodesics, and we had a proper time t, which we identified with the coordinate time. So this distance between here and here was actually t. And uh, this thing was coordinate coordinatized by some spatial coordinates xi and we found, showed that ds squared was could be brought to the form minus dt squared plus gij of both x and t dxi dxj what is the analog for the null case And here we reach our first surprise. We are looking for the analog of a surface sigma that can emit null geodesics, not time-like geodesics. The problem is that a Cauchy hypersurface can't give off null geodesics, or at least it can't be. Uh, it yeah, it it basically. Uh, let let me explain the statement. Um, let let's restate it as a theorem. Um, yeah, it's correct what I said. A Cauchy hypersurface can't give off null geodesics. So the theorem is that if a space like submanifold is orthogonal to a null direction, then it is orthogonal to two null directions. Weird but true fact, and we are about to prove it. Two means the one that it was taken orthogonal to, and there's one more. So two independent null directions are orthogonal to it. Before I give you the proof, this implies that such a manifold has dimension at most d minus 2. d is the total space-time dimension of m. While the Cauchy surface had dimension d minus 1, so we called it a hypersurface, and we said, well, that's all the space directions, and then time goes out from it. This guy is going to have dimension d minus 2, and there are going to be two types of null geodesics going out from it. And this is going to complicate everything, but it's a very essential feature of null directions in Lorentzian geometry. It's even true in Minkowski, and it's easy to prove in Minkowski just using coordinates, but I'll give you a coordinate free proof. Witten provides a proof also using coordinates because it's a local statement. 
Hmm? Orthogonal means something relation between a tangent vector at a point and some normal vector, which is a vector in the underlying manifold M. And so you can actually assume a coordinate system near a point and do everything near that point. So actually coordinates are fine, but let's do a more general discussion, which will maybe help us to understand the underlying geometric reason. So consider a null vector. W. So it satisfies W dot W equals zero. Okay. Remember W, don't forget that W dot W means G mu nu, W mu, W nu. G mu nu is the metric, is an arbitrary metric on M. We don't know what it is. And we're not going to use it explicitly. In fact, we're trying to find a nice form of it. But right now it's perfectly general. Okay. So the null vector is w dot w equals zero. Okay. Now consider uh, the submanifold of it of M orthogonal to W. That means that if V uh, so submanifold, let's give it a name already, S. Hmm? Submanifold called S. I'll throughout be calling it S. Okay. So if V is a tangent vector uh, to S, then V dot W is zero. That's the submanifold, right? Now in the time-like case, we didn't have a null vector W, we had a time-like vector W. And when we considered the submanifold orthogonal to it, it was automatically space-like because uh, in some coordinates, you could imagine that the time coordinate is orthogonal and everything else is space. -like. The problem now is that even though S is orthogonal to W, uh, W still lies in S. So we thought we've, uh, yeah, uh, Sanket, I'll come back to your question in a minute. Uh, the problem is that if V dot W is zero, well, W dot W is given to be zero. That's the null, the statement that it's a null vector. Therefore, W lies in this submanifold. Okay. But W is null. So this can't be a space like submanifold. That implies S cannot be space like. And we didn't assume anything. We simply said, uh, consider a sub-manifold orthogonal to a null vector. And we said that if it's space-like, um, then uh, it's actually orthogonal to two null directions. That means it's not of dimension d minus one. It's of dimension d minus two. And we've just shown that it's not of dimension d minus one. So S, so defined over here, has dimension d minus one, but it's not space-like. Okay. I hope that's clear. W is basically orthogonal to itself. So if I define a manifold orthogonal to it, it lies in that manifold. In fact, uh, it actually says that S, there's a name for such a thing. S is called a null hypersurface. So hypersurface, I believe, always means a surface of dimension D minus one. And this is null because it has a null vector W in it, along with lots of other space-like vectors. And as we will see, uh, its signature is actually zero plus plus plus, where zero is uh, the null direction, okay? Signature zero, because along that, anything pointing along that direction, its dot product with itself is zero. This we are going to see later. So I'm not going to try and prove it here. Uh, but this is some fact that you'll find useful to remember. Okay. Now, therefore, to get a space-like surface, so this I actually, I shouldn't have called this S. Uh, well, this S is an, okay. To get a space-like surface S, use another vector. 
which I'm going to call capital X. And impose x dot v equals zero, and also um, require that x should not be parallel to my original w. I had a null vector w, x should not be parallel to it. If x was parallel to it, then x dot w would be zero. So we require that x dot w is not zero. Okay, now if we impose x dot v equals zero, as well as the original condition, w dot v equals zero, then we are doing better because we have uh, two conditions, x dot v equals zero, w dot. So we are trying to look for all v, that's the submanifold, such that x dot v is zero and w dot v is zero, but x dot w is not zero. Okay, so now we have a D minus two dimensional manifold and let's show you that it's space-like. The way we see that it's space-like is um, um, W does not satisfy this condition, does not lie in S anymore. Why? Because although W satisfies, if W uh, was in S, uh, it would satisfy this condition but it wouldn't satisfy this condition because we've chosen that x dot w is not zero, okay? And the new vector x also doesn't lie in okay? Because x, uh, if it lay in S, would satisfy this condition, but then not this condition. So we conclude that S is orthogonal to both w and x also w and x are linearly independent for two vectors to be linearly independent they shouldn't be parallel and w dot x e uh, not equal to zero ensures that they can't be parallel because if they were parallel since w is null x would also be null but it would be just the same as w okay and then the dot product between them would be zero Okay, now the last thing to show is that actually x itself can also be chosen null. Right now, I didn't choose x to be null. I just chose any generic vector x uh, that has a non-trivial dot product with w to define a sub uh, a, a submanifold s. But now I'll show you that x can be taken to be null. First of all, if x is null by chance, then I'm done. Then w and x are two null vectors and s is orthogonal to both. But if x is not null, that means x this dot is not zero. zero. Sorry? In this case, uh, if, if I take x as null, then x and w will be orthogonal, wouldn't they? No, sorry. If I take x as? If I take x as null, null. then, yeah. I mean, if I take both of them, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, they would be orthogonal, but that means x dot w is not zero. Orthogonal, in a, you see, orthogonal is a bad word to use in a context of null vector. They would be linearly independent is the correct statement. Okay. Not they would be orthogonal. See, w is orthogonal to itself. Yeah. X, if x was null, it would be orthogonal to itself, uh, but it would be linearly independent of w. That's guaranteed by this statement. I mean, uh, in a in a in a uh, light cone picture, th these will be like two lines within the same light cone, right? Yes, that's correct. There will be two two linearly independent directions within the same light cone. All right. Yeah. Now, if x dot if x is not null, I'm going to define for you a y which is null by the formula that y is equal to x minus x dot x upon twice w dot x w. So in other words, I subtract from x a piece proportional to w with this coefficient precisely. And now let's verify that y is null. So y dot y has three terms. One is x dot x, which we have assumed is not zero. The second term is this whole thing squared times w dot w, but this is zero. 
W was originally taken null. And the third term is minus 2 x uh, dot x dot x over twice w dot x w and you see that everything cancels out and you get zero okay so y is null and moreover y is still linearly independent from w because y dot w is the same as x dot w from the uh, fact that w is null so y and w are linearly independent null vectors One way to think of them is basically uh, in, in, in physical, in, in our space time, uh, take a photon traveling along the z-axis and another one traveling along the minus z-axis. Okay. So one of them has the uh, momentum vector uh, uh, one, one. So let's say P comma P comma zero zero this is in momentum space the other has p comma minus p comma zero to zero note that the first p is always positive that's positivity of energy but the second uh, is the spatial momentum the first one is actually its energy and the second one can be plus or minus p and these are two null vectors both of them but their dot product is non-zero and they are linearly independent as you can clearly see P comma minus P is in proportional to P comma P. Okay. Uh, this is in momentum space. In position space vectors, the first component will be the time. And so for future directed geodesics, it will be positive, but they can be future directed and moving along some direction X, or they can be future directed and moving along minus X. And these are the two. Uh, this is momentum space example. I gave this because it's familiar. Uh, another example is Minkowski space time. Both are in Minkowski, but uh, point this is uh, points in Minkowski. And I can take a point t comma t comma zero zero. So this is in your light cone and it's null. And I can take another point t minus t zero zero. And is also in the light cone and it's also null. And this we can think of as our W and this we can think of as our X. And you clearly see that in the Minkowski metric, W dot X is non-zero. W and X are linearly independent. And also what you see is that uh, points orthogonal to both, that is those such that V dot W and V dot X are zero, are of the form zero, zero, X one up to x d minus two, which is space-like. So in Minkowski, it's very clear that by taking this situation where the sub-manifold is of dimension d minus two and orthogonal to two null vectors, you get a space-like. Basically, the goal was to get a space-like one. And the problem was that we didn't settle on a space-like three manifold in four dimensions but rather a space like two manifold in four dimensions, which because it's a two manifold has two directions orthogonal to it. Both those directions are null and linearly independent of each other. So actually this two manifold can emit not one, but two types of null geodesics. Okay. And I hope this makes it clear that both of them are future directed here. Yeah? If we take T positive, then there are two different null geodesics both going into the future. If I take T negative, then there are two different both going into the past. So the difference between these two is not related to past and future. Okay. I can think of both as future directed and linearly independent directions. Is that point clear? Okay. And now that we've established it, we Can need to, a... um, we can construct a coordinate system. Um, coordinate system using null geodesics. The weird thing is I get not one, but two coordinate systems. This is analogous to what Rai Chaudhary did. He constructed one coordinate system using time-like geodesics. 
That's not what he, how he wrote it. It's not even how Wald writes it, but it's how Witten wrote it. And also I think how Sachs like to think about the null case that we are basically constructing a coordinate system using geodesics as a method to find the coordinates, thereby simplifying the coordinate system to a point where Einstein equations become solvable. Any questions up to this point? Yes. So we are actually talking about a 2D surface in 4D. Okay, 2D space-like surface. So uh, in fact, uh, that's nice that you brought that up. In Minkowski, imagine that our 2D surface is a sphere, a two-sphere, hmm? a spatial two-sphere. Okay, now it can emit null geodesics coming out of the sphere, and it can also emit null geodesics going into the sphere. And these are two linearly independent null geodesics. Okay, spatially, they don't look linearly independent because they go along the same direction, but as space-time vectors, they are independent, linearly independent. Okay, what you could say is that the outgoing geodesic into the future is ingoing in the past, but there's also an ingoing geodesic into the future, which is outgoing in the past, you see? So there are really two, and this is the point. This is the intuition. Is it clear? Okay. Now what I'd like to do in the remaining time, uh, there are some theorems uh, about spaces being closed, which we are going to use, but I feel that it will be a digression to go into them here. They are in the notes. Uh, they are basically going to be applied to the future of, uh, maybe I'll just state the theorems and uh, leave you to read the notes. The theorems are actually quite general and we should have proved them earlier in the notes, but they are going to be applied to this uh, thing S. So this space-like surface we are going to call S and everything that we do from now on will be uh, for our space-like surface S. Uh, which is of dimension d minus 2. So the theorems are that if I take the causal future of the whole surface, remember causal future of a surface is the union of the causal future of every point on it. Okay. And okay, we are also going to actually, uh, so these theorems hold uh, sub if S is compact. And I just gave you an example where it's compact, right? It's a two sphere. Now, you can already see that S being compact makes life a little interesting because you see that the outward going geodesics just go out, but the inward ones sort of bang into each other. So there's something that the compactness has done. So compact is interesting and we are going to need that when we discuss black holes. Then the theorems say, first of all, that J plus S is closed. We discussed closed sets quite long ago and you may have forgotten. That means they contain their limit points. Del, the boundary of J plus S is also closed. Uh, and J plus S is also acronal. Closed and acronal. And these are all, um, uh, these are theorems that you can prove we, in some sense, uh, should have proved them earlier. In fact, Wald has proved some of these, the closed ones, uh, much earlier in his discussion, and I should have also. But anyway, I'm just putting it out there. When I use these theorems, you will have to agree that I have mentioned them once. But uh, the proof is quite, uh, to the extent I'm giving any proofs, uh, they are quite simple. And when the proof is complicated, I've referred to Witten's notes or other references for the proof. Okay, so with that, we can now get down to actually discussing the way to find the null right of the equation. And remember how things went with the time like case, we set up a coordinate system. So again, we have to set up a coordinate system, but this time based on not a Cauchy surface sigma, which had, which was D minus one dimensional, uh, and then it had time like geodesics, but S, which is D minus two dimensional. In M. So let's do the following. Okay, first let's recall how 
geodesic equation works. So the geodesic equation is always this. Uh, sorry. Uh, rho sigma. No, lambda rho. Lambda. Okay, that's the geodesic equation. And tau is an affine parameter. Now, the first thing that we did when discussing the time like case was to identify tau with the proper time because that's a valid affine parameter. Okay, and remember that this above equation uh, retains its form only if we send tau to a scale times tau or a uh, additive constant. Hmm? If you reparameterize tau in any other way, then you get a right hand side to this equation and it's a more complicated equation. So we won't even go there. Okay. Now, in the time like case, we were able to fix both a fixed by saying that tau is equal to proper time. Proper time is not a negotiable, scalable thing. It's a fixed thing in a manifold. You have two points. There's a proper time that doesn't between them if they're time like separated and it does not depend on your choice of coordinates and there's nothing you can do to change it. Okay, so A was fixed by that and B was fixed by the origin of T and I'm sure you remember where the origin of T was. We drew geodesics out of our Cauchy surface and we said that that Cauchy surface is where T is zero on every geodesic. So that was easy. Okay, null case is going to be more difficult. B can still be fixed similarly because remember null geodesics are going to go out from this. Okay, and we are going to measure something along these. And so that the affine parameter, and that's going to give us some coordinate and it's going to vanish at these points of meeting S, no problem. B can still be fixed, but there's really no way to fix A. So it will remain arbitrary. In fact, it's not just A, it's actually going to be, uh, a is going to, A can even vary along, along S. Okay. So tau goes to A of X tau will be allowed in general. But even if you want to, so that of course will change the form of the geodesic well actually yeah it doesn't also change it's so a sorry uh, i said something wrong a of x is allowed because uh, it's it's functions of tau that are not allowed this has to be constant in tau that's what this equation meant but since we fix uh, tau for every point on our initial surface s uh, we can choose its scale independently so just to keep in mind there's such a freedom uh, it's not going to bother us too much okay now with this freedom, make an arbitrary choice. Choice of tau. And that choice, we'll call it tau equals u. So we've defined a parameter u, that's the parameter, affine parameter along a null geodesic and we are calling it u, okay? And because we have defined it, however, arbitrarily, it means that every point of a null geodesic has some value of u. You can actually calculate the value of u to reach here from here, even though the proper time was zero, u is not zero. And so you can say that uh, this point P is a null time u into the future of S. We start thinking about u as like a time, except that it's null. So we choose tau equals u, okay? And now what we do is very simple. We take this S and we draw all these null geodesics and we parameterize every point P by in the same way we did 
uh, for the time like case by u, namely the amount of null time it took to get from s to there such that u vanishes exactly on s over here and here. And then x a, which are coordinates of s. Remember, we always take the point of view that when there's a space-like surface, its coordinate choice is a problem of Riemannian geometry and somebody has done it. There's nothing exciting from the point of view of causality about choosing such coordinates. They must exist because S is a Riemannian manifold with proper positive signature metric. And so some coordinates are there and we don't even care what they are, okay? So in this way, we've created uh, a family of geodesics out of S uh, with co and we have quadrantized points which lie on this family as u comma x a, but there's something missing from this discussion. We haven't managed to span the whole manifold M because S is d minus two dimensional, and we've taken a null geodesic out, so that adds one dimension. So it's d minus one dimensional. Okay. So what we actually get uh, next. Uh, every point on a null geodesic. From S is given a spatial coordinate. I just said this, I'm writing it now. X A, A equals one up to D minus two. I use A and B instead of I and J because in our previous discussions, I and J went from zero to D minus one. Sorry, went from one to D minus one. One went from one to D. I'm going crazy. Uh, went from one to D minus one. Yes. Okay. Okay. There's one less over here. Okay, that I think should be clear. In 4D, this is a 2D manifold. And so A only goes over one and two. Okay, so U and X A spans a D minus one sub manifold. And we'll have to give it a name because it's not a, uh, it's not of the dimension of M in M. Okay. Now, this is an interesting submanifold. What is the signature of this submanifold? Can you guess? Signature of this submanifold, anyone? Anyone there still? Ah, zero plus, thank you, thank you. Is zero and plus plus. So what is this? I already defined it. It's a null hypersurface. So there's one more step in order to cover M. And uh, that step uh, is done as follows. And that step is a little ugly necessarily. Uh, and Witten has sorry, given can a, I ask statement. a question. Sorry. Please, please. Uh, what guarantees that Y is a sub manifold? Yeah, so actually, uh, we haven't yet guaranteed that. So maybe I was a bit hasty in calling it a sub manifold, but it turns out that we'll be able to say Y is a sub manifold. So um, Y is basically, uh, yeah, okay. Let, let, let me not say that. Uh, let's just say a subspace. Although at least locally, we've given a kind of structure on it as a direct product of S and a null geodesic. So at least until some focusing happens, uh, it's going to be a submanifold. Would you agree with that? It's, it's analogous to the fact, you know, when there was a Cauchy surface, if you translate it in time, that's the geometry of M. M has the geometry of Cauchy surface sigma times a line. So in the same sense, Y right. has the geometry of S, which is not a Cauchy surface. It's a D minus two dimensional surface times the U line, which is null, but which just runs over a real line. So un unless there's focusing, R it's a matter. And in, huh? 
Yeah, it's exactly. an R cross S topology, but uh, manifold yeah. wise, we don't know, right? Well, we've just defined a nice. Uh, we've defined something which okay. Uh, it's uh, the metric is has got a null direction, but it's well defined metric. You can write the metric on this. Okay. In fact, it's the same as the metric on uh, on S because with one more direction which has no metric in that direction. Okay. I should have said these geodesics are also taken orthogonal. And so we'll even see that the metric on Y doesn't have a mixed component G U A. So yeah, I still I think it's a submanifold. Okay. Now the next step is crucial. Let's again take our S. And this time let me draw Y like this to represent only the fact that it doesn't fill uh, the whole of M. It's of one dimension lower. Okay. Now, the idea, as explained nicely by Witten, is to embed S in something bigger that we, I will call T, which is also space-like, and define a way in which T is sliced by S. So you have slices like this. Maybe I should have drawn T slightly differently. So let me first draw the slices and then, okay, and this is T. So T is given as a subspace, in fact, as a, as a um, space-like hypersurface to be precise, nicely embedded in M. And the idea is that this will be our original S and all these others will be a family along a direction which we call V. So a particular one at a value of V will be the subspace S of V, okay? Every S is D minus two dimensional. So if I add slices of it parallel to itself or rather perpendicular along a direction perpendicular to itself, then I'll generate all of T and this gives me the extra direction V. And note that nowhere did I say V is null, okay? Now I'm running out of time. So let me just state this here and then I'll pick up on this next time. So pick a, I'm just trying to state the same thing again. Pick a space like <coughs> manifold, so hypersurface. So embed S in a space like hypersurface T. Hypersurface means this dimension is D minus one uh, and generate T by slicing up, by copying S. This is quite a standard construction in algebraic geometry. So you take a manifold and first you embed it in something bigger. So T is already given, but now you find coordinates for T which correspond to the coordinates you already had on S times a new coordinate, which is orthogonal to S. And the procedure for that is in my notes, but I'll discuss it next time, okay? And then the idea is that I erect a copy of Y, just as I did Y, I took null geodesics orthogonally going out from S. So from every copy of S, every S of V, I'll make a manifold Y of V. And this family of Ys for all different Vs together will fill up something of dimension D, which is the same as the dimension of M. And then I can do the job of asking that when does this coordinate system break down? So this is only to define a coordinate system and we should be happy if we can do it in some finite neighborhood of the original S. And then we explore how geodesics go un until they focus and then the coordinate system breaks down. Okay, so the key point I wanted to get across, and I think I've done it, hopefully, is that we start with an S, which is of dimension D minus two. We use null geodesics to make a D minus one dimensional hypersurface, but it's null. That's not very good. Then we pick another direction, which is orthogonal to S. In fact, it's orthogonal to this, well, not necessarily orthogonal, but linearly independent of Y. 
and we generate copies of y along that other direction. Hmm? And then we'll write a metric in the coordinate system inspired by this construction and claim that's the most general metric. So I'll write this. Yeah. So the union of these, so, so the union of S's should fill up T. That's correct. Okay. And then uh, the null geodesics out from T uh, will fill up uh, M until they break down. Okay. And um, now you, you may argue that, and this point hasn't been mentioned much in the literature that I can see. You may argue that this is not going to be something obvious because can I take S, embed it in T and then slice up T as some kind of foliation by S. Um, it might require us to change coordinate system. So we might be able to do it in some part of T and then we have to do it differently in some part of T, but that doesn't matter. Because S we are allowing to be topologically non-trivial, we are allowing it to have multiple coordinate patches. That's all embodied in the coordinates X. So we are not going to worry about that part. Okay. So uh, yes, the idea is to generate all of uh, uh, all this family of Ys. And in fact, when we write the coordinate, see, this is all to inspire a coordinate system. When we write the coordinate system, it will be clear that this coordinate system is a valid coordinate system on M, okay, which has S as a base if I go to V equals zero and U equals zero. Okay, and as I go out from S, the U direction is null, that's by construction and it describes null geodesics. The V direction is generic and it's not necessarily null, though in principle it might be possible to take it null, but we don't do that and in fact that's not the best choice. Okay, but we need two independent directions, U and V, orthogonal to S. You might imagine that the U direction is like my vector W that I defined, and my V direction is like my other vector uh, X, which I defined later, okay? And if you remember, X was not taken to be null, but W was taken to be null. So it's a bit like that. So next time we'll write down the coordinate system inspired by this construction. And in the meanwhile, uh, the notes will be up and you'll have to go through them so that you get some better idea of the precise statements. And then uh, we'll, uh, write the right of the equations, which as usual, once you've done all this homework, will be very simple. That won't be the hard part. Okay, I'll stop here. Any brief questions? Uh, uh, I have maybe a stupid question, but uh, did we did we start with saying that M is a globally hyperbolic? Yes, yes, yes. Right? Absolutely. How, how, do you, how do you see that that's still the case? Because you have like the metric on Y was zero plus plus plus. Yeah. And you are introducing another space like V. Yeah. How do you see that in this? Well, country? you can have a, in a globally hyperbolic manifold, you can always have a null, uh, null hypersurface. That's not a problem. And in fact, the lesson from Minkowski will answer your question. Take Minkowski. Yeah. Okay. Let's take S to be the X1, X2 plane. Right. Okay. Now let's add a null direction. Right. So we have U, X1, X2. Hmm. Now add any other direction which is orthogonal to S, which means orthogonal to X1, X2. So it lives in zero and three directions, but it's not exactly parallel to the null vector. Right. And then I've got a, I've filled up Minkowski happily. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. There was a question showing above showing that a prompt path can later be non-prompt. Non yeah then there cannot possibly be a prompt shadow of P2, P3 unless P2, P3 is time-like. No, no, that's not true. If the path P1, P2 is prompt initially, there can be a shadow of P2, P3, even if P2, P3 is null. Why do you say that P2, P3 should be time-like? Let's go there. You can unmute yourself if you want to discuss this, but uh, let's see if I can uh, find the diagram. Ah, this is the diagram. No, uh, this is the diagram. This one. It's initially prompt. It can later become non-prompt. So the idea is that uh, this is given to be prompt. This is not given to be anything. It's only null. Both this and this, in fact, this whole thing is null. 
Okay, the whole thing is an algeodesic that we start with. And we are given that this is an algeodesic and this much and this first part of it is prompt. Okay, and we are asked whether the whole thing, the whole null geodesic is prompt, can become non-prompt. And the answer is yes, if this part is non-prompt, then there's a shadow. But once there's a shadow, I can combine it with this to get a causal curve that beats the original null geodesic. Therefore, the original null geodesic is not prompt. Yes, only null paths can be prompt. I said that right in the beginning. It's only among null paths that we even ask the question of being, uh, I should have said it if I didn't say it, I'm sorry. We did note that if a path is not prompt, it can't be null, which is the same as saying that uh, only null paths can be prompt. And that's because uh, if I have a non-null segment, then a null segment between those two points will beat it, will reach earlier. So the non-null uh, so non segment will be dead right there. In fact, it's going to connect points which are not all in the boundary in, of the causal future. They won't be in del of j plus of p, they'll be inside j plus of p because time-like curves go inside while null curves stay on the boundary. But actually, as it turns out, it's really prompt curves that stay on the boundary throughout. Yeah. I, I must uh, uh, emphasize that promptness is pretty tricky. And in fact, that's because null geodesics are pretty tricky. But achronality might be a helpful way to think about them. And I may actually rephrase some of the notes in that language. Is there a physical meaning to you since the proper time is always zero? Yes. Absolutely. No, there's no physical meaning. And uh, Shikhar, there's never supposed to be a physical meaning to a coordinate system. That's the whole point. That's what coordinate system means. Something with no physical meaning that we use, that we construct arbitrarily and use in order to derive consequences which have a physical meaning. So there's no physical mean meaning to you for sure. It's just an arbitrary. That's why I said it's also scalable. So you can't even, uh, but you fix one of them. And you do everything in your fixed coordinate system. That's all you need to do. So I better stop. This is getting quite long. So let's stop the recording here and stop uh, the lecture here. And I'll see you day after tomorrow, Monday. Hmm? Thanks, Sunil. Yeah. Bye, everyone.